That's looking lovely, Lou. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Um, well, I'll also start by taking the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we're all participating in this webinar today. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging leaders. So this is me, I'm Lou Baskin, I'm the district vet with the local land services um, and I'm based in the Braidwood office. So I've been doing that job for about two and a half years now. And before that I was in private practice as a vet for eight years. Um, I worked in a variety of different um, areas. So I've been here in the Tablelands, um, Sydney, Alice Springs and the UK. So now as a district vet, my role is primarily in what we call surveillance. So we're looking for um, pests and diseases of animals, either to prove that we do have the disease or to prove that we don't have the disease. But it's a very varied role and I'm also involved in emergency management, um, advice around animal health, communications and lots, lots more. And being here on the Southern Tablelands, particularly in this in close proximity to the peri-urban areas around Canberra, I have a particular interest in small farms and in small mixed farming. So the mission that Alex gave me for this webinar was to talk all about alpacas. Um, I will do my best, but I think we might not be, be able to cover everything about alpacas um, in the slot that we have. Um, so let's just say we'll talk much about alpacas. Um, starting with, you know, what are they? What, what sort of an animal are they? Um, so they belong to a group called the South American camelids. And you'll see there the, the um, word camel. So yes, they're very closely related to camels, but they are the specific group that are from South America. There's um, four main species of South American camelids, um, both the domestic llama and alpaca, and their wild counterparts that they were domesticated from, the guanaco and the vacuna. So they are uh, a herbivore and they eat fibrous grasses. Um, they do have a split foot similar to our cattle, sheep and goats, but instead of having a hoof, they have a soft pad and then a toenail. Um, they grow um, a fiber coat, which is one of the, the reasons that alpacas are, are prized throughout the world. And they, um, their digestive system has a stomach with multiple compartments. So they have three compartments. They are related distantly to our other livestock ruminants, um, but they actually diverged from them in the evolutionary tree 40 million years ago. So one of the um, interesting differences between um, camelids and ruminants is that they have a different stomach structure, even though they both um, evolved to have um, a fermentation chamber with multiple, with multiple segments. So they call that parallel evolution. So um, they, they both basically solve the same problem in slightly different ways. So the anatomy of the stomach is a bit different, but it does do the same thing where it's actually um, a big chamber that microorganisms ferment the food. And that uh, makes them quite good at eating fibrous um, forage grasses. So just a quick sketch there on the slide of the three stomach compartments that the, um, that the camelid has. And they um, food goes into this big sack that's got these sort of lots of little other um, protrusion saccules on it as well. And it's a big area where everything sort of um, soaks and ferments. And like ruminants, they can also regurgitate that food back up into their mouth and chew it again. So you've got their compartment one, two, three of the stomach and then the intestines are where the nutrients are actually absorbed into the animal. Um, so like I said, that makes them quite efficient at digesting low quality and low protein fibrous grasses. So, um, you know, we could not eat grass alone and live off that, but that's what they are designed to do. They're actually somewhat better adapted to do that um, than ruminants. Not to say they're a sort of set and forget animal that you don't have to think about their nutrition and just um, put them in, in, in any grassy paddock, um, but they can be quite efficient at actually digesting those foods. They also interestingly have a, a slightly less risk of bloat compared to, to ruminant animals. So these um, camelids were domesticated by indigenous peoples in South America in the, in the Andes Mountains. 
and that's you know several thousand years ago, three and a half to five thousand years BC, um, and they really relied on them, depended on them to to um, supply their needs for food, fuel, fibre, and transport. The fuel um, part I find interesting because they actually used to use the dung of the animals to um, to burn for for heat and and cooking. Um, so let's have a look at the two the two domesticated South American camelids, the llamas and the alpacas. So the llama is a bigger animal, so it gets to about two meters in height and about 200 kilograms of body weight. And it's got the sort of um, a few physical features that, that distinguish it aside from size to the alpaca. It's got a straight top line along the back. Um, it's got these long and curved ears that are referred to as banana shaped, quite a long face. Um, they do have a fleece, but it's a more of a, a strong fiber and a variable quality or length compared to the alpaca. So the alpaca is a bit smaller, goes to about 1.4 meters and only 50 to 70 kilograms. So similar body weight actually to sheep. They've got this sort of more rounded rump, um, little ears that are a bit spear shaped, a short face. And their, their key characteristic is that they have superior quality um, fleece, a very fine fleece and it grows nice and long. So it's um, very, very useful. Amongst the alpacas, they've been bred into sort of two um, distinctly different lines based on their, um, their fleece. So we've got the, the wakaya um, there on the left that has the, the, the fiber grows sort of perpendicular to the body wall and it sticks out and it becomes this sort of fluffy teddy bear sort of um, coat on them. And then you've got the suri, which where the fiber hangs down more from the body forming these sort of tassels or, or ringlets um, and that's the, the main distinction between the two breeds. So when we think about well you know why might I have an alpaca or what are alpaca is useful for um, there's a range of different things so um, alpacas particularly for the fiber that's a that's a key one it's a really really high quality lovely fiber and they can be shorn and the fleece processed for that, um, for using that fiber um, as a wool, similar to with, with sheep. Um, llamas, you can use the fiber as well, but as I said, it's sort of a more of a, st a stronger type, uh, fiber type. Um, they're used quite commonly in Australia and certainly here in the um, Southern Tablelands. We see a lot of this where they're actually used to guard livestock, guardians. Um, and then we've got breeders and they use for showing they make a, a lovely um, sort of farmyard pet or companion animal. And then they do have other uses which are a bit less common um, in Australia, but, but still um, an option. They can be farmed for meat. Llamas can be farmed for milk, um, less so with alpacas, just with their small size and small udder. There's not a lot of yield there. Um, their hides um, can be tanned for leather. And as I said, llamas, um, their main purpose in the in the South American Andes is a pack animal sort of taking people and goods through those um, mountain trails. So why they make good livestock guardian animals is that they they're actually quite respectful of fences and they're they're a really gregarious animal they're not solitary they like to form a herd and um, they'll bond with other um, domestic species. So they'll form their herd with, with other species, not just other alpaca or llama. Um, they're very, very protective of that herd and they particularly dislike canine species. So they'll make a noise, they'll alert their, um, their group to the approach of a predator and they'll chase them away. They might even stomp on them. They're best used for fox management, um, just given the the size of the predator versus the alpaca, when you get into that territory of trying to um, defend against dogs, they don't manage so well with, with dogs, especially if there's multiple dogs. So they will alert um, their group to the approach of a dog, but they, um, they're not as able to defend against a dog. Um, they're actually used to protect lots of different animals. So the most common use for them would be for lambing use, protecting against foxes, taking those lambs away. And you just need one or two alpacas for a mob of up to about 600 sheep. Um, they can work for, you know, about 15 years if you look after them and keep them healthy. So they're, they're a really good investment. 
I've just put a note there um, about uncastrated males, um, just that they, um, they've got strong motivation to mate and they will try and mate the sheep as well and they can cause injury like that. So it's not, not really recommended. Okay, so what are the requirements if you're thinking of getting alpacas or um, making sure that you're providing them with that, with what they, what they need for good health and welfare? Um, first of all, in terms of space, so there's not really a defined amount of space that they specifically need. They, you know, they're quite amenable to being on small farms um, or even being, you know, this, I have seen some of that are backyard pets, but you need to be sure that they've got all the space they need to display their natural behaviour. So you've got to think about grazing, resting, cushing is the word, um, used to describe when they sort of sit in that seated position and I know that's a picture of a camel there but I just thought it um, it so nicely displays those awkward legs the way they sort of have to fold them up underneath themselves and I'm sure if you've seen um, someone trying to ride a camel that process of getting uh, from the camel getting from the ground to standing or vice versa is, is pretty awkward um, but yeah that word for that is um, to cush to be in that seated position um, they also um, they're quite fastidious in their um, dung habits. So they form what's called a latrine and they'll go back to the same um, spot and make a dung pile. Um, so they're quite clean animals, but obviously you want enough space that that dung pile um, isn't anywhere near where they want to rest or, or eat. Um, they need to have companions. They, they, as I said before, they're not solitary animals. They must have at least one companion. Um, but the, other, the companion does not have to be um, another camelid. Um, they, can, they can form bonds with other livestock as well. So having a look at their requirements for nutrition, as I said, they, they basically they are grass eating animals. That's what they're adapted to. So what we want to have a look at is whether the grasses available on your property are sufficient to meet their requirements and if not how would you um, how would you supplement to make sure that they're getting everything they they need so when I'm working out feed requirements for an animal we've, we focus first on energy and protein of the feed um, and that doesn't matter if that's coming from pasture or supplements we always have to work out what is the energy and protein that that animal needs um, that's in order to survive, for their organs to function normally and to maintain their body weight. So that's the baseline. You work out what they need to maintain their body weight. So it's fairly variable um, depending on the sort of activity and en energy expenditure that they're doing. But, but what we're looking at here, I'll talk you through. The, the next couple of slides might seem a little bit complicated, but I'll just talk you through them. When we're measuring energy, we're using a, a unit called megajoules and we work out how many of those megajoules of energy an animal needs in a single day. And in this case, I'm working it out for a 70 kilogram alpaca that's dry. And that dry terminology means that they, um, they're not reproductive and they're not growing. So it's not an animal that's pregnant or um, developing milk to feed a, a young animal or growing. They're just uh, maintaining their, their sort of um, standard body, body weight and functionality. So, um, so at the sort of low end of how much energy they might need, um, somewhere around 7.5. But if they're having to walk a lot, um, you know, they're very active or they're, they're using energy to maintain their body temperature, that can go up to about 9. Um, only low requirements for protein, sort of 9 to 10%. So the next step after you know how much energy they need in a day um, is to know how much they can eat because you need to know that the energy fits into the volume of food that they can actually fit into their stomach in a day. And dry alpacas, it's about one and a half percent of their body weight. It's actually less than, than ruminants. So, um, you know, a cow, for example, can eat about three percent of her body weight. Um, a dry um, alpaca, you're looking at about one and a half percent. So here we've got our 70 kilo dry alpaca. Um, he's eating about one kilogram of dry matter per day. Now we work that out on a dry matter basis because it allows us to compare different feeds. Um, hay and grass are different in how much water they have. So, so we, we calculate 
um, the dry matter component to account for um, comparing them more directly. So, so as I said, we now need to know in one kilogram of dry matter in a day, um, can we provide this animal with his 7.5 to 9 megajoules that he needs? And that's going to be quite dependent on the stage of growth of the grass pastures that you have. Um, so here is a, a graph from our ProGraze course, and it's looking at the, the temperate um, pasture grasses. And you'll see on the right hand side, there's a scale of energy and that's in the megajoules we were talking about per kilogram and in dry matter. So um, at the top of the graph, an actively growing green plant um, has quite high energy in the order of sort of 10 to 11. Um, and at the bottom of the graph where the plant has gone through its reproductive stage and set seed and has died off, it's quite low. So down to about 5.7 there. So for our alpaca that's in that pasture, if he needs nine megajoules um, in that kilogram, he's going to need those grasses to be somewhere between actively growing, green, just starting to flower, um, and that will meet his needs. If he's, um, it, if he's, as I said, if he's needing that higher range from nine, the plants need to look like that. So. Um, that's, you know, if your plants are in that range there, you've got no trouble. You won't need to supplement him with anything. So just as a visual, you know, nice green plants um, in that active growth stage, um, all set to go. When your pastures are starting to look a little bit more in that kind of mid flowering, there's a little bit of dead material or late flowering. This is where you're going to have to monitor for whether you need to start adding in some supplements or not. So if they're going to seed and there's a combination of kind of green and dead material, you're going to have to monitor body condition to know whether um, additional food and additional energy needs to be provided separately. And that needs to be hands on. Um, as we looked at the pictures um, at the beginning of the way that the fleece grows, it really can mask the body condition of the alpaca underneath and they won't give you any other signal that they're losing body weight. They won't appear unwell. Um, they can look fine. And once you get your hands on, realize they've actually lost quite a bit of condition. So um, body condition scoring in alpacas needs to be with physical touch, um, not just by eye from a distance. And then if your grasses have gone to that sort of real dead grass, they won't be able to um, maintain their body weight on that. So if you're looking at, you know, the pastures looking a bit like that, which there are some places um, around the place at the moment that may look like that, they'll lose weight on that. Um, you know, it's it's there'll be a mix in your in your pasture as well. So you might have some that's dead like that with green stuff growing um, underneath. I stopped on the side of the road today and watched some alpacas grazing and saw how efficient they were at, at putting their head through. Um, the dry stuff and finding nibbling at the green stuff underneath. So it's just knowing what you've got and monitoring body condition. So that was the dry animal. But as soon as we go to growth, pregnancy or lactation, our requirements increase a lot. Um, so in that picture there, the baby is growing. Um, the crea, as we call it, is growing and needs um, increased energy and protein for that. And the mum who has to make milk. Um, very high nutritional demand. So if you're doing um, breeding and you've got mums and bubs, you really need to have um, that really actively growing green grass um, just coming up maybe to just start going to, to vegetative, but it needs to be green and not going to flower or seed. And they, that's fine. You can um, set them on not, that and not need to supplement, um, but any less than that and they'll need supplementary feeding as well. So in terms of supplementary feeding, as I was saying, if you don't have the energy and protein that you need for that animal in the pasture, you'll need to supplement. And I've got a few tips and tricks on how to do that. Um, the first and most crucial is that you must ensure that they are getting long stemmed forage at all times. So that their, um, their digestive tract relies on being developed for eating um, forage grasses with high fiber so that has to be provided at all times and the, 
the rule of thumb is that they, they should have access to fibre that is longer than four centimetres um, at all times. So there's various things that you could supplement with, just a good quality hay, like a lucerne or a clover, um, or other hay that's tested to be high quality, um, that's putting in more energy than what you've got out in the pastures. And you can also use grains, oats, wheat, barley, lupins, etc., cetera, or um, pelleted feeds. So if you are using um, pelleted feeds or grains, it's really not recommended to do any processing. Sometimes we do want to spoil animals by, um, you know, making them up a lovely ration with all the bits and pieces and um, making it into chaff and soaking and looks delicious. But really, they are designed to do that. That is what their gut is for, to process and soak that feed. And if you, um, if you over process, then you, you don't have those strands that are over four centimeters long and the gut health will suffer. And that's true even if those um, pellets for are uh, specifically for alpacas and they're high fiber pellets, you still need to make sure that um, somewhere in the diet on a daily basis, they're getting long stemmed forage. A couple of other little tips is just making sure that everyone's got access to the trough at the same time so you don't have some gorging the food and others too shy to join in. Um, trough length should be long enough that everybody can get to it at once if you're um, feeding high energy foods and you want to give their gut time to get used to um, supplementary food, um, less so with haze but certainly with high um, concentrates grains um, and pellets just introducing it slowly, slowly, slowly over sort of two to three weeks. And you don't want to go too, um, too excessive on the pellets. So my rule of thumb is half a kilogram per adult per alpaca per day. Um, and, and if you've got good grass in the pastures, then they won't need that. Um, just on that point about long stemmed um, fibrous forage again, if they do have very, very short green grass, which is high energy and high protein, um, it really doesn't hurt to also give them some low quality hay with those long stems just to make sure that they're getting their fiber requirement. Sometimes feels a bit funny to supplement feed when you have everything that you need in the grass growing um, on your block, um, but you're providing something different by that supplement, you're providing fiber. So I'll just cover over now um, handling of alpacas. Um, I think this sometimes does make people a little bit nervous. Uh, I've certainly met a few, um, a few local landholders who've bought a property that sort of came with a couple of alpacas and, um, you know, they feel confident to handle the sheep, that are the little flock of sheep, but the alpacas sort of get left out because there's a bit of nervousness about handling them. Um, the good news is they're actually quite, um, well, they're quite good to handle and they, they're quite cooperative if you just follow some basic principles. So as for handling any livestock, you just want to um, adhere to some basic safety principles, remaining just alert and aware of the situation, trying to watch the body language and observe for changes in behaviour. The animals will tell you if, they, um, if they're stressed or, or not feeling that what you're doing suits them um, and it's a signal to you to change your behavior if they're not um, coping um, or if they, they're communicating that to you so just watching behavior and learning behavior is, is really helpful um, I always recommend Q fever and tetanus vaccinations if you're going to be handling livestock for your own um, health and safety and then try to make sure that you do have enough time that even if things go a little bit unexpected or a little bit wrong, you've got enough time that you will stay quiet and calm and not rush. The more you rush, the more it's all just going to, to go badly and turn into chaos and be quite probably quite frustrating for you. So um, don't plan to do husbandry procedures or anything like that, you know, as you get home from work um, in, on an autumn evening and the sun is about to set in 20 minutes, just plan it for when you can really take it easy. Um, so as I said, they're generally a pretty safe animal to handle and um, pretty cooperative. Um, 
you do, just do want to be careful of males, like not castrated males that have been um, bottle fed or hand raised in particular. Um, they don't really know that you are a person and not an alpaca and they will interact with you as if you were another alpaca. That might mean that they want to fight you or it might mean that they want to mount you. And both of those could, um, could be quite dangerous for yourself. So just, you know, be extra vigilant of where they are and, and their behaviour. Um, a lot of people would, would um, house those animals sort of separately to the group. It's not a great idea to sort of chase after alpacas in the paddock and try and um, catch them. Um, their, their flight response will just make that, well, if not impossible, very stressful. So moving the group into a small yard so that you can then um, have a controlled restraint of a single animal is the way to go. You can use visual aids in your hands. So, you know, um, they call it a wand or you can use herding tape. If you feel that having something in your hand might tempt you to use that to tap on the, um, tap on the animal or touch the animal with it, just don't have one. Um, it's just supposed to be something for them to see, not for you to, to actually touch them with because um, it can cause injury and fear. So the principles of, of moving um, alpacas is very similar to all other livestock. Um, herd animals is that they have a, a flight zone that if you move into that flight zone they look for an escape route and we um, we use this to our advantage by making the escape route the only option of where we want them to actually move to it's important that once you do that you actually take the pressure off so you move back out of the flight zone because that actually rewards the behavior and makes an animal that's more that's easier to handle and move so just to illustrate that, here I've got um, an alpaca. I'm looking down uh, on it from above, and that dotted red line is their flight zone. And we've got a person that we're looking down on from above as well. So that person would move into the flight zone. That's what we call um, putting the pressure on or applying pressure. As they move in there, the animal responds by moving away. And then you want to move back out of the flight zone as a reward. There's also something that we refer to as the point of balance. So that is, um, that is on the shoulder of the animal. If you stand behind that line, they will move forwards. And if you stand in front of that line, they'll move backwards. Um, so that's, that's good to know. And that can sometimes can be a little bit confusing with alpacas um, that can be a little bit confusing with alpacas because their long neck and their ability to, to move their head around um, you might think that you need to sort of work with where their eye is um, but I would recommend sort of aiming to work with their point of balance being here where their shoulder is so as I said you move the group into a small yard and then you can either contain or restrain um, an individual that you need to do something with so um, containment is um, a lower stress option so you would use something that we would call a shoot um, which is basically similar to a race but it's um or a crush but it's got these sort of high sides and a bum stop um, and it just keeps them in, in one little position there and then if you do need to, if you don't have a shoot or if you do need to sort of physically restrain um, it's a case of um, you know, you approach and you're sort of gentle but decisive and you've got one arm that comes up under the, under the chin and then around the top of the neck. Your, your other hand is putting a bit of pressure on their withers there just to stop them jumping and your knee is positioned in front of their chest so that they don't go forwards. And it is helpful if you've got um, two people, so one person would be doing the restraint and then the other person's doing the, the procedure, whatever it might be, giving a, a drench or an injection or something like that. They're pretty amenable to learning to lead on a halter as well, um, which makes it easy to, to move them around and, and lead them around. It does take a bit of training, but they, they, um, they take to it pretty well. Just remember that they, um, when they breathe, they have to breathe mostly through their nose. Unlike other animals that breathe through nose and mouth, they are very dependent on breathing through their nostrils. So if you block the nostril, it's quite stressful for them. They, they feel at risk of or are at risk of suffocating and they won't be cooperative at all. So even a, 
a badly fitted halter that um, where that nose band slips forward onto the cartilages there of the nostril, um, they're really going to sort of arc up at that. So just be sure that you're um, you're fitting those halters properly and that you, you're considerate of their nostrils. And when you're restraining them in that um, slide before, when you're restraining them around the neck as well, just be very considerate of not covering the nostrils over. So I'm going to cover um, a couple of their sort of more common health problems and, and preventatives. I've got a list here of, of the main ones. I probably won't go into too much detail of every single one just um, in the interest of time, um, but those are the main the main sort of health things to know about and that may need management or prevention. The, the two that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail are vitamin D deficiency, because that's quite um, particular to, to our South American camelids in, um, in Australia, and also liver fluke and worms, because it is a very common problem um, that is probably not as well managed as it should be. So the area of the world where these animals originated, which is the Peruvian Andes Mountains, has some of the highest UV radiation in the whole world. It's very high in altitude and it's very close to the equator. And so in that environment, animals don't need to be as efficient as sort of synthesizing vitamin D from UV or keeping it in their body because there's just plenty, plenty, plenty of UV radiation. Um, so when South American camelids are moved from their home ranges in the Andes to other places in the world, they, where the UV is lower, they can get a vitamin D deficiency. And it's very surprising but true that even in Australia that you could get um, not enough UV radiation. So I'll increase the size of that image there. So the, the band up the top shows you the UV um, radiation scale. And you can see in, in southern and eastern Australia, we're in that sort of bright green band, which is at 14 to 16 range. In, the, in this um, band of red that you see on South America, red and orange, that's where alpacas come from. And that's sitting in that sort of 20 to 24 UV radiation range, so much higher. Vitamin D deficiency affects mostly um, calcium metabolism in an animal. So when they're trying to grow strong and healthy bones, vitamin D is an essential component of that. So if they don't have the vitamin D, they get what's called rickets. And what you might see is they might seem, you know, lame on one leg one day and lame on another leg the other day, sort of shifting lameness. They don't want to move. They might do this funny, um, funny game with the back legs that we call bunny hopping. Um, you might see that their joints actually swell and, and might even become deformed, what, what is described as having knock knees. Um, vitamin D is also involved in immunity um, and other essential functions in the body. So they may be ill thrifty or sort of poor doing, lose weight, become anemic. Um, one of the classic signs is animals that um, lie down, graze, like they just lie down, they don't really want to move, but they're still eating. Um, they can even break bones uh, that are poorly developed with the calcium. So the creas, the baby animals, are most at risk because they're growing and they're laying down all that calcium in their bones, and that's up to about three years old. Prevention um, should be, you should be preventing this condition in all alpacas, and it is fairly straightforward to manage. So shearing every year. Um, you want to take off that fleece coat so that they get better exposure of their skin to UV radiation. Um, and in particular, dark coloured animals um, suffer from vitamin D deficiency even more. Um, so that's really important. And then you give a vitamin D injection supplement, in, particularly in growing animals and also in any other animals that may be at risk. You can do an annual injection too. Um, recommended to give the injection to pregnant females before they give birth as well so that there's lots of vitamin d in their colostrum for their crea uh, just a note that the the formulas that vitamin d comes in um, are usually combinations with other vitamins as well and these vitamins have a fairly narrow safe dose range so you need to know what you're doing in terms of how much to give more is not necessarily better 
um, you can have um, side effects from overdosing. So talk to someone who's very knowledgeable or talk to your vet. So the next thing to, um, to cover is liver fluke. And liver fluke is a parasite that actually um, migrates through the tissues of the liver and causes real damage in there. Um, alpacas are very sensitive to liver fluke. It, it can make them very sick. You might just see alpacas die and not know why. They could be jaundiced, losing weight, anemic. Um, they can actually develop liver failure. Um, it affects the quality of the fleece that they're growing. They don't tend to be um, as fertile if they've got if they what we call fluky or infected with fluke, and they can get secondary bacterial infections that can also lead to heart failure. So excuse the quality of this image, um, but I just wanted to show you the um, the fluke the liver fluke life cycle. So there's a lot of different animals that are susceptible to it. If they've got a fluke infection, um, they pass the fluke eggs out in their dung. Those hatch in environments where there's um, wet conditions and they look for something called a laminid snail. That's their intermediate host. They infect the snail and they develop in the snail. Then they erupt out of the snail and they attach themselves as a cyst to vegetation in those wet areas. So the next time um, an animal comes along and takes a mouthful of food, it's actually ingesting the fluke as well and that life cycle continues. So in the southern tablelands, we definitely have um, the snail. It's quite endemic. It's across um, a lot of properties. It's quite hard to control the location of the snail. If you have the right habitat for it, um, it tends to find its way there. It can get washed across from a neighbor's property as well in a, um, if there's runoff in a storm. So we just uh, work on the basis that if you have um, wet areas, so creeks, um, springs, boggy areas, marshes, things like that, you probably have the snail um, and, and therefore the, you're, you're most likely that your animals are at risk of getting liver fluke as well. Um, so the best, absolute best control is to, is to use a fence, is to fence them out from grazing those areas where the snail um, habitat is because then you just um, cancel the ability of that, of that um, fluke to complete its life cycle. Um, over and above that as well, if there is infection, um, you can use chemical drenches. I do recommend in this area, at least where we say that fluke and the fluke snail is endemic, is to do a chemical drench for fluke once a year. And we time that um, with, with the first frost of the year. If, um, if it's a particularly fluky property or there's problems um, and, and there's evidence on testing, that you might need to drench more often, um, that's also possible. Some properties will be drenching up to three times a year. Um, getting advice from a, from a vet or, um, or other experienced advisor about the fluke is the best way to go and you can do testing to see if it's a problem on your property. So worms are another one um, that fit in that same sort of category of with the fluke as being a parasite. And unfortunately for our alpacas, they're actually susceptible to both the sheep goat worms and the cattle worms. So they can pick up both of those. So if you're running an alpaca only property, um, because they're quite hygienic and they have those sort of communal latrines where they pile up their dung in one area, um, they're a bit less likely to pick up worms because the worm egg and larva is there where the, where the, um, where the dung is. Um, but certainly if they're sharing paddocks with any other livestock, they, they're more likely to pick up those worms. So um, they really need to be, be managed for. Why do we worry about worms? Well, they, um, they can cause poor growth, weight loss, anemia, abdominal pain, weakness, collapse and death. I put, you know, plus or minus diarrhea there. Um, you're probably aware that in sheep, for example, scouring or having diarrhea is a sign of worms. Well, alpacas and well, camelids in general are very, very adapted to use, utilize water very well and not, not waste water. So their large intestine reabsorbs water very effectively. So even if the worms are causing the problems that would cause diarrhea, by the time that diarrhea gets down the intestinal tract to the large intestine, 
a lot of that water gets sucked back into the animal again and the dung that comes out isn't necessarily wet or loose. So you won't always be able to rely on diarrhea as a sign of an animal being wormy. When it comes to managing worms, we, we want you to use something called integrated worm management. Worms are not just about using chemical drenches. Um, and at the same time, they're not about just never using chemical drenches. That it, there are a lot of different tactics that you can use to manage worms on your property. And I think in particular, um, with, with smaller farms, worms can become a real issue. So um, it's worth knowing all these different techniques so you can try and keep the worm burden as low as possible. So you want to keep them in good health, looking at their nutrition. A healthy animal with good nutrition is more resilient to having worms. They can actually handle having a few worms and it won't make them unwell. Um, you don't want to overstock your property because it means more dung and more likelihood that animals are grazing where they've, um, where they've actually defecated. They're allowing that worm life cycle to continue. Um, pasture should be a little bit taller, just above the sort of three centimetres, because most worm eggs and larvae are down underneath um, that, that height. And so if they're grazing a little bit above that, they pick up less. You want to use um, monitoring and testing to know if you've got worms. And you want to manage your pasture to try and reduce worms that might already be there. I'll mention that in the next, we'll have a look at that in the next slide. Um, I do recommend a couple of routine chemical drenches. I'm not a fan of just drenching, drenching, drenching all the time, but there's a couple of key times that I think it is important as part of integrated worm management. Um, that is creas when they are weaned. It's a very stressful time um, and they will not handle having worms at all. And it is, I would say it's essential for their survival and for thriving that they're drenched at that point. Um, and then I like to drench the whole herd at the start of summer as well. Um, and then at other times of the year, rather than just drenching routinely, you're looking at monitoring. So I mentioned there about um, reducing contamination of the pasture with worm eggs and larvae. And that's by a process called spelling, which just means leaving the pasture alone to not have animals grazing on it for a period of time so that those, um, those worms actually die out. Now, when you look at our, our um, environmental conditions and what worms require to, to either survive or be killed, when we're looking here in sort of um, the, the southern tablelands, which is um, this column here that says cooler tablelands areas of the worm control region, um, you, what you want to do is you want to work backwards from when you might want to use that, that paddock and, um, and that, you know, particularly crucial times would be for a weaning paddock or for, it says lambing there because this is a sheep table, but, um, you know, at the time of, of unpacking. So, so if you want to be using that paddock late winter or early um, spring, which is when um, babies are being born, you actually need to work back five months from there and five months prior to that, lock it up and say, well, we're not going to use that. It can be a tricky thing to do when you've only got um, a limited number of paddocks or limited area altogether. And, and unfortunately, you can't cross graze with other species because alpacas are susceptible to, as I said, both sheep and cattle worms. So when we're looking at our chemical drenches that um, we're going to use at weaning and, um, and as, a, as at the beginning of summer and potentially at other times if there's a problem, if the monitoring suggests that we do, um, that can be given as an oral dose. Um, it's not recommended to use um, pour on treatments. They, sh they should be getting dosed orally, as you can see in that picture. And they actually need different doses to what would be on the label for, for sheep. So um, talk to your vet, get an off-label authority of how to use it. What, what's the correct dose for the alpaca so that it's effective and a recommendation about what's the best chemical to use for, um, for your situation. If you are unfortunate to have an unwell alpaca, um, it's important to realize that once you'd notice that an alpaca is sick, they are very, very sick. They are very stoic. They don't like to show any evidence that they're unwell. Um, and as I mentioned before, they, they can hide weight loss under their fleece. So they can have a chronic problem and be slowly deteriorating. And um, by the time that they let you know, it's quite, it's actually very serious. So if you have an animal that's down, 
they're not getting up and they're not eating, that's really critical. Um, and if they are sick and they end up lying down on their side, that's actually pretty much what we would say is end stage. There's also some crucial um, signs when, when breeding alpacas to know when to call a vet um, while they're giving birth. Um, but that's probably um, for a separate webinar, more advanced webinar. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important to know what to look for and to call that quickly if you're worried. And on that note, I think it's quite important to know before you have a problem, you know, who's your vet and, and that you're going to call if you do have an emergency. And it's worth, you know, making contact with them, establishing a client record so that they know you. And all the formalities um, are dispensed with before you actually give them a ring. Um, if you, if it's possible to, and it's affordable to you, I would definitely recommend if the vet has to see the animal to try and get the vet to come out to your, um, to the property, to the animal. Alpacas do not do well with stress at all. Stress can um, really push them over the edge is probably the best expression to use for that. Um, and transporting them is a pretty stressful thing for them. So if you can get the vet out, then try to do that. But um, a lot of vets in our area, um, you know, they're not necessarily able to do those call outs at short notice to, um, to onto farm. Um, so if they can't get to you, then take the alpaca to them. And you saw in that list before, there's a few other important health topics. Um, I'm not gonna go into them in too much detail, but just a couple of mentions, shearing. It is important to shear them once a year um, or if the fleece gets to more than 12 centimeters, even if you don't even have intentions to use the fleece, it's for their health and welfare, for their skin health, for their, you don't want them to overheat. And also in between shearing to just keep an eye on um, fleece that's growing over the eyes um, and give that a trim if they're effectively blind from, from the wool. And that's also very important if you're using them as a livestock guardian. If they can't see the predator, then they can't alert to the predator. Um, pulpy kidney, um, which is a disease usually associated with overeating of grain, um, but can also happen on lush pasture and can also just be one of those things where um, an animal can suddenly die that can be protected for with five in one vaccinations. And that's a cheap routine insurance against um, just losing an alpaca without outside of your control. So five in one vaccines, you give the priming dose and a booster dose. And then every six months, which is, um, which is a bit different in terms of recommendation to our standard sheep and cattle dosing. So it's more frequent, you're actually dosing them every six months. Um, there are a few, um, a few plants in our region um, that could potentially be toxic to alpacas. I've listed them there. Um, your Patterson's Curse and Fireweed, you're probably already aware of. Um, rye, um, ryegrass and Phalaris, is, there's a few different factors. It would depend on which, um, which you have on your property and some other things. So if you, if you do have perennial ryegrass and Phalaris, get some advice about whether there's any risk. Um, or what risky times might be to not graze it. Um, and then just keeping um, in your mind that if these alpacas are a sort of companion farm pet and are going to be coming into the, the backyard or the garden, um, there's some plants there that you need to avoid them grazing. So um, rhododendrons, azaleas, oleander, avocado, um, which you may have um, growing, just be careful because they can be quite toxic. So I'll just quickly cover over the requirements, your sort of regulatory responsibilities if you do own alpacas. Um, so currently, unlike with sheep and cattle, we don't have a um, specific requirement for permanent identification. So they don't have to be tagged. And there's not a movement database. So you don't have to transfer them in a database from one property code to another. But you do have to have a property identification code if you have alpacas on your on your property and you have to let us know when you get your annual um, stock return that you fill out the sort of census of animals you have to let us know if you've got alpacas there um, the 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 property identification codes and um, return of stock that's that information is used for um, knowing how we're going to respond if there's some kind of emergency so whether that's a biosecurity emergency whether there's a disease outbreak 
um, and we need to know where the animals are that that could spread to or whether that's a natural disaster emergency and we need to know who's going to need our help. So it's really important that we actually have that information. Um, if you're transporting alpacas from one property to another, there is actually, there is actually one piece of um, documentation that you'll need. It's called the transported stock statement um, and you can get the forms from local land services. This is a piece of information that if you are, um, if you're pulled over by the police while transporting animals, they will want to see this documentation as you're moving your animals. If you have um, pedigree alpacas, so you can actually register them as pedigree animals. And it's the Australian Alpaca Association that runs the register. And you might notice um, if, you've, if you've inherited some alpacas and think, oh, why has it got this tiny little brass ear tag in? So that's their international alpaca register ear tag. So that confirms their unique registration number to be on the pedigree register. And it's convention um, for the, the, that little metal tag, that brass tag to go in the right ear if it's a female and in the left ear if it's a male and with, goes along with the very gendered joke of females are always right. Um, you can also, if you wish to, use another color-coded sort of plastic farm management tag in the ear. Um, not a lot of people do, but if, you, you know, if you've got a breeding program or something like that, you may need to distinguish different animals you do have to be a little bit cautious when placing tags in alpacas ears. You have to be very strict with your disinfection procedures. Now the next slide I've got, I don't expect you to read every word on, but I do just like to acknowledge the fact that um, when I do these presentations, I am taking images from um, other people's websites and I just want to put the references there so that we can acknowledge that those images um, came from somebody else's intellectual property. Um, but the, the one after that is worth having a look at. So those are just a few of the many links that you could, if you're really getting interested in the alpaca side of things to get some more information, Australian Alpaca Association, of course. Um, worm Boss is a fantastic resource in terms of that integrated worm management and for fluke control as well. Um, it is based on sheep and goat, but a lot of the principles are very much, um, it, um, you can go across to alpaca management as well. Um, Tokel produces a great little guide on all the practical farm skills you might need when you have alpacas um, from, you know, from restraint to where to give injections and how, where, how to give drenches, you know, even how to get a grass seed out of an eye, all these, you know, um, really practical skills. Um, Temple Grandin's resources about herding animals and moving them in, an, in a low stress way, um, I think is fantastic. And I recommend for any livestock, herding livestock that you have to look at her resources as well. And then I've got a link there to Waratah Alpaca Fibre Co-op. I haven't um, touched base with them for a little while, but my understanding was that what they were trying to set up um, was a way to collect the fleece off, um, off alpacas where, where smart farms had only you know, one, two or three, and then to, to put that fleece together and make a marketable product because um, sometimes that fleece, you, know, you might not be able to uh, make as much value of it if you've just got a couple of animals. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in trying to commercialize your fleece, um, but you only have a few animals, they're the people to talk to as well. So I think that um, that pretty much will will do the basics for today. Thanks for listening. And um, and if you've got any questions that you haven't popped into the chat box just yet, um, pop them in there now, and I'll see if we can um, if we can answer a few of them. If there are questions that I don't manage to get to um, or don't know the answer to, I'm more than happy to send out an email. Um, after the, the webinar and, and follow up on those questions that you might have. Okay, that's, that's wonderful, Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, everyone's been really well behaved and haven't put anything in the chat box yet. Um, but um, would you like to uh, stop your screen share? Yeah, sure. And... Um, 
There we go. There we go. Thank you. Oh, Haji's raised his hand. Um, what I'm going to get you to do, Haji, if you can, is just put your question um, in the chat box. Oh, we've got two raised hands. Um, just if you can put your um, question into the chat box. Um, can you, if you can manage that, that would be good. All right, so I'm going to start off with a question, Lou. How can I test whether my alpacas have worms? Ah, well, that's actually, um, that's a very straightforward procedure. You can collect fresh dung from the alpacas and you can actually send them into the lab. So, um, so local land services supports that worm testing. We have the kits at the offices and um, and we'll often also be able to just, you know, if you let us know, we can drop in a kit as we're going past, you know, on our rounds doing other things. And in the kit is just some little jars and you collect the dung, you fill out the form and it just goes in the post and it goes to the, um, to the state vet lab. Now there's, there's sort of two ways to do it. You can, you can um, constrain, con contain or restrain the alpaca and take a sample um, directly from the bottom so that you could say this is a very fresh sample that came from this individual um, but the other option is if your patient is just to um, spend some time with them and wait and watch and as the sample drops to the ground just pick it up it's just a case of that sample being nice and fresh and it goes off to the lab and they count the number of worm eggs in there um, and you'll get a report to say um, what level it is and then again local land services can support you in making decisions about whether that's a level that needs some kind of chemical treatment or it's just a case of monitoring at another time again. Thank you, Lou. And the other one that I had was, um, do you need to trim their feet regularly? So um, there are some alpacas that may grow like those toenails may overgrow. It's, um, it's not a great trait and it's recommended not to, you know, not to sort of breed it in. You want to breed animals for having a really um, nice foot conformation. Um, but if they are growing in a way that they sort of, you know, the claws are growing over each other or it's causing lameness or, or any issues, you can trim them back. Um, and again, it might be something where it's worth getting advice from someone who's experienced just to know where it's safe to cut. Um, it's a bit like cutting the, the claw on a, on a dog or cutting your own sort of nails is there's a, there's a dead part and there's a part that's got some blood flow. Um, so you can trim them back with, with the same sort of shears that you would use to trim a sheep foot. And it depends on the alpaca what level of restraint they're going to need. I think it's always worth trying just as you know, a calm and steady approach in the in the shoot, as opposed to physically holding them and see if it'll you know see if they'll um, be happy for you to pick up a foot and give it a trim. Um, you won't know until you try. But sometimes what needs to happen is when the um, when the shearer comes to do the shearing and they're more um, restrained because when they when they restrain for shearing they actually get put on their side on a board and that might be the time to just trim up their toes. Great. Thanks, Lou. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and um, just invite Haji to talk. Um, and, and I'll invite anyone else who had their hand up or would like to put their hand up. Um, I can also do the same thing for you. So um, Haji, I'm going to allow you to talk if I hope that's okay. Um, so have I got you, Haji? Yep. Oh, great. My chat box is not working. Oh, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if everyone doesn't have a chat box. Ah, all right. Well, let's try it another way. Let's do the, the raised hand. Would you like to ask your question? Um, the, my question is, the, do the males and the females, like, uh, I mean, entire male and female need to be kept separate all the time unless they are mating? Yes, it is. Um, it is a good idea to do that because they will. Um, the female can sort of get pregnant at any time 
um, of the year. They don't have the same sort of specific seasonal cycling as some of the other animals. Um, so if they're kept together, the entire males and the females, they will um, be able to breed. And um, that means you won't sort of have control over the time of year that those babies are getting born. And what we like to do most of the time in livestock is try and match up the time of birth of a baby animal with when that feed quality is going to be there in the pasture. So when remember we said we've got to have that that really um, short green growing grass when the when the um, when the alpaca is producing milk. We want that timing to line up. So if you keep the males and females together, you'll get um, creas at any time of the year, and nutrition is a lot harder to manage. Okay, so that is the only reason, or there's other reasons too. And I think um, similar reasons for for keeping this separate is just also that behaviour of um, uncastrated males as well is that they they are um, they are driven by certain urges and um, that can be quite disruptive. All right, Haji. So I'll ask you to um, mute yourself if you don't mind, and I'm okay. going to ask uh, one more question. So I'm oh, sorry. Yes, oh. please go ahead. Hello, hello, brother Alex and uh, <clears throat> Lou. Hi, um, hi, Sunita. Hi. Um, so, uh, so you mean to say that once the female is pregnant, it is better to keep the male separate from the female so that the male does not keep on hassling the female. Yes, I think so. And and um, I mean, it may be something to take advice from people who are very experienced at breeding. Um, but my understanding would be that it's it's. Uh, you'd have a sort of more um, calm and um, contented herd to keep those entire males separate from the, the female, the pregnant female and the babies, uh, the right. creas, um, to manage them separately um, is, is usually that what most people would recommend, yeah. Thank you. So the other question is around, you know, how a lot of people suggest that when the, when the birth is about to happen that we should actually bring the female undercover look kind of mm. you know take it take her out of the paddock mm. and at the same time there is this logic that in nature that happens all the time so we should keep minimal interference let let everything happen as naturally as possible so what would be your adv advice for you know people like us who are just hobby farmers um i think I think you can sort of achieve both. So what you want to make sure of is that the area that the animal can give birth has um, the safety and security that she needs to not be um, not be disturbed and not um, have problems with um, with predators and for it to be somewhere that's nice and hygienic. So if you can achieve that in the paddock, then, and, and you're able to monitor her, you know, keep an eye on her so that if something goes wrong, you can respond quickly, um, then you don't need to um, intervene too much. Um, but that, that paddock environment needs to supply those things of, of safety um, and hygiene and being able to be monitored. Can I ask one more question? Thank you, Lou. Can, sure. Alex, can I ask one more question? Uh, just quickly, please, Sunita, because we've got we've got about five other people who okay, very or six quickly. now. What do you but, say? Like you know, the llama and alpaca crosses are coming. There are quite a few examples of that. Mm. What do you suggest? Is that a good thing to do? Um, I think it's it's. Um, I don't really have an opinion. I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve. I think um, some of those crossing has been done to try and change fiber characteristics or animal size or etc. They can interbreed, and the um, the offspring of those those crosses are also fertile animals. Like you know, they're closely enough um, related that they can. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't have a specific opinion about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Great. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Lou. Nice. Okay, Judith, I'm going to unmute you now um, if you would like to ask your question. Thank you. Um, look, that, that was absolutely fascinating. So first of all, thank you very much. I learned a lot. Um, I've got one question. We um, are moving to a country in the Hunter and we want alpacas, but we have a very um, dopey Labrador. And you mentioned at the beginning about canines. So 
that was one of the things that raised a bit of an alarm bell with me is how do um, alpacas interact with domesticated dogs, particularly Labradors? That's a great question. So um, inherently they don't, they don't like um, dogs um, sort of as a rule, um, but there is really, you know, there's really good evidence that if they get used to a domestic dog that is part of um, their sort of day to day and they get familiar with that, that dog is not a threat to them. They can cohabit with it um, quite contentedly without being too stressed. So, and I suspect given the breed that you have um, and, uh, you know, a dopey version, there are, there are two types of Labradors in this world. Um, but if you have the type that's not likely to hassle the alpacas they will get used to it okay thank you no problem so i'm going to unmute josephine now so she can ask her question lou great can you ask your question josephine can you hear it can you it's been so informative um i have three alpacas and i just learned so much tonight so thank you oh um, fantastic Wondering, I've noticed them eating. Um, there's a, we have a little bit of bracken in some sort of more native areas, and I'm just I've noticed them just nibbling at it. Like they basically have a lot of great pasture, but mm. how toxic would the bracken be for them? You didn't have it on your list. No, and I don't I don't know specifically how toxic it is for an alpaca versus sort of um, other species, but bracken does have some toxicity as a plant, it's usually the very newly erupted little um, fronds of bracken that are coming out of the ground that are that are higher risk. And it's usually younger, sort of more naive grazing animals that are more at risk. Um, but I would think probably if they're just having a, a tiny little nibble as part of the rest of their diet, I wouldn't worry too much. It'd be a case of if they if that's all they had to eat sort of thing, you know, hungry animals with only one plant available that has a toxin, that's where you really get plant poisoning issues. A little nibble and it decide, oh, you know, I wasn't really that interested in that, but I wanted to check it out. I wouldn't worry. Great, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to invite Christina and Josh to um, talk now. If you'd like to ask your question, Christina and Josh. Uh, yeah, hi Alex and Lou, and thanks again for uh, for everything tonight. Um, so we've got three we've got three alpacas, and we're very new to owning alpacas. So we've found a lot of this to be really helpful as well. Um, oh, good. But some of the questions we had was, uh, were we able to access the slide pack? Is there somewhere we can download that from from tonight? Yeah, we are going to get either, um, at, at very least, there will be a summary that Alex is going to write up and put on the Small Farms um, website. And um, if possible, I'll try and get the slides out to you. It just goes through a little approvals process within local land services. So I'm hoping to get the slide pack out to you if I can. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Because uh, we didn't quite remember all of that detail. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. And, and also, we've got a lot of, uh, of pine trees on our boundaries and notice that the alpacas are quite interested in having a nibble on the pine needles and just wanted to make sure there was no issue with that. So pine needles, um, the timing that pine needles can cause a problem is in pregnant animals. So um, particularly in late pregnancy, if they are grazing those pine needles, they can actually lose the pregnancy as a result. It, um, there's, a, there's a toxin in there that actually cuts off the blood supply to the fetus. Um, so if you are doing breeding with your alpacas, then um, while they're pregnant, I would try and make sure they can't eat the pine. Um, but at any other time, it shouldn't cause an issue. Okay, great. Thanks very much. No problem. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Um, so I'm just going to invite um, Megan to ask her question now. How are you going, Lou? Are you all right? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay. So Megan, if you could, um, have I, um, Megan, yeah, can you yes. hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, we've yeah, got look, you. Thank, thank you. you. Megan. Thank you very much for this. It's been great. We've, I'm a, an ag teacher and we've got nine alpacas at school at the moment, but a couple of them have just started frothing at the mouth. 
any ideas? Um, I probably would have to take that offline and I'd be happy to talk to you in more detail. Probably just takes, um, it would need to look a little bit at the nutritional history and some other factors. So yeah, happy to have a chat with you um, offline about that, Megan, no worries. Okay, that'd be great, thank you. No problem. So I think you did put up your email at some stage, didn't you, um, Lou? Yeah, it's, um, I, I can't, what I'll do is I'll reshare my screen quickly. Yeah. Um, and my contact details are there with my email address and my phone number. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, anyone who's, um, who's participating, um, you're more than welcome to send me an email if you've got any, um, any questions. That's great, Lou. So um, I'm just going to invite Sarah to ask a question, if that's okay. Yeah. You there, Sarah? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we've got you. Oh, um, thank you very much for all the information. Um, I just had a question. Um, I have a Kriya who's uh, almost seven months old. Um, I just recently sort of took her away from her mum for a week to try and um, wean her because her mum's mm. pregnant again. Um, and I've taken her back in, noticed she started drinking again, but she's mm. lost, she kind of feels skinny. She's happy yeah. enough in herself, but she just feels a bit bony on her back. Yeah. Um, would you kind of recommend supplementing in a certain way or? Yeah, I probably would. She, she's, um, she's probably, they, look, the weaning process is very stressful for all mammals. And, um, you know, part of what will happen is that because that um, there's that emotional stress, she may not even really have been eating because she's mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, can I get back to my mum? and have a suckle of some milk because you know that's milk is life um so it's not that uncommon for weaned animals to just sort of um not go forward as we say in terms of body weight at the time um, but it sounds like she might need a little bit of additional um supplementation so what you could do is while she's now back with mum is introduce um, everybody to the supplement so she can learn from mum to eat it and then have that available when she goes away. So something like a really high quality hay, um, she'll learn from mum to eat it. And then when, when you move her to the other paddock, then she'll have a bit more of a go of it. Is there, is there anything aside from, say, Lucin that you would recommend um, as a supplement? Um, yeah, you in terms of hays, um, you want to talk to your rural supplier and ask them, for the energy content of the hay. A lot of suppliers of hay will have had a feed test done. Um, so you're looking there for something that's sort of in that order of, of eight and a half or more um, um, megajoules in terms of energy. And if you can't find that, then you'll want to use a little bit of grain or pellet to boost up that energy as well, but just taking it slowly and carefully. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Oh, thank you. That's great, Sarah. So, Lou, we've got three more people and um, my little section at the end is only going to take a minute or so, so I'm just going to keep going through them if you're okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. So we've got Sue's on the line now. If you can ask your question, please. Can you hear us, Suze? All right. So I'm not, not sure if she can hear us. Oh, she... Um, all right, so we'll, we'll skip Sue's for the moment and we'll try Lando, our packers, if you could ask, if you are, would like to ask well, a now, question. Now I'm going to get a hard question, aren't I? <laughs> Can you? <No. laughs> okay, cool. Thank, thanks, Lou and uh, Alex, for doing this. This is wonderful. We're, we're quite new to the, to the game as well. I mean, like we're, I think, what, maybe eight months, eight months in, um, we've got, 14 alpacas and our first baby Kriya was uh, yep. born on the 30th of January so that was very exciting well, well done <laughs> yeah. um, but this is more like um, for those people that are new like we've got three big dogs like we've got a mastiff a German shepherd and a pointer mm. and we we moved from the city to the country on the 14 acres and it was an adjustment for the dogs but you know the alpacas you know when they first met the dogs were quite anxious and mm. you know doing their little hoot every time yeah. they see the dogs yeah. but they've, they've become accustomed to them now and they know mm. our dogs 
if there's anybody riding on a bike, push bike, riding past, whatever, or even like going up the other side of the road, they they're very alert. They, I mean, you know, skittish animals yeah, anyway. Amazing. But yeah, but you know, they always alert us when there's something that's not right. So you know, we come and check on yeah. them. But um, yeah, I was just yeah. thinking too when when they're um due to have the crea, I mean, yep. like our our girl was two weeks overdue. So I mean, like. To, to sort of remove her from the paddock she's quite flighty because where mm. we um, purchased her from she was on like over 100 acres and mm. she was let to run wild with the others so when we brought her here with the rest of our girls in our herd she's um, not one that likes to be touched or you yeah. can't really get close to her so yeah. I found leaving her in the paddock with the rest of the flock was less stressful for her yeah. so um yeah, it was just more, I think you've got to gauge each alpaca individually um, to, yeah, to, remove her, to remove her from the flock and try and keep her, you know, separated for those two weeks when I thought she was due, I think was just not, not wouldn't have been good for her. Yeah, or, I agree with that. And they, um, they yeah. do have quite a, like, variable gestation period. So um, knowing exactly when they're going to have their crea, um, it can be, like you say, you know, it can be sort of that two, three week range of where it actually is going to happen. Um, so mm. I'd probably, I, I would sort of more lean towards that having a, um, you know, a smaller, just a smaller paddock that's close to the mm. house. And it just means that you, if something's going on, you notice, you know, you just check on them and they're easy to see. They're not sort of way out the back over the hill and yeah. when they, yeah. but, but they're with the, with the rest of them together. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah that's just yeah I just wanted to sort of share that like even though we're new like we, we are, have sort of learnt to you know which alpacas would sort of benefit from that sort of separation and yeah the other ones okay. that are very flighty to just leave them with the rest of the flock to feel safe and you know yeah, yeah. great thanks so much. much for sharing yeah thank <laughs> you yeah, that's, that's great okay. yeah can I right. ask a question while we're here sorry it's, I'm the other part of the land <laughs> alpaca. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, okay what's your name uh, we supplement their food uh, possibly more than most people do, I guess. Uh, we've just learned from a few other uh, experienced breeders that have been doing so. We give them mm. uh, lupins, alpaca pellets. Uh, you spoil them, uh, in other words. Yeah, yeah we spoil we them. Do. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's not every night, but it's at least every second night. And plus yeah. it's a, a bit of interplay that we can go there and pat them and, you know, yes. get them accustomed yes, to human there's... touch and all. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. But are we doing too much? Because the, the grass is quite green this season, whereas last season it was as dry as. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, we, it's a, the, the, can, can we, you overfeed them sort of thing? You can, you can. So, so okay. I agree with you that um, supplementing is not just for food. There's other benefits to it with that. You, re, you know, you're giving them a food reward for responding to you well and for wanting to come up and come into the, you know, a lot of people will get their alpacas into the yards with food rather than with herding. So exactly. I think there are other benefits there. Um, and I also agree that we the contrast in seasons from last year to this year is absolutely astounding. Mm. Um, so, But you can make them over fat and there can be health issues with that. So, um, you know, just think of the supplement as a little treat and a little reward, but it's not the main sort of bulk of where they'd be getting their nutrition at the moment. So yeah. I'd still give them something, but probably um, you don't, you know, you don't need to go overboard with what they're actually getting from you yeah mm. okay yeah i just find it helps with the bonding that's all yeah. more than totally, anything yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, i definitely agree yeah yeah that's okay. wonderful um contribution there thank you so much thank you nice no thank you okay so we've got two more um lou oh susie's popped back up again but um so i'm asking sarah if she'd like to ask a question can you hear us, Sarah? So Sarah's muted at the moment. So oh, sorry, oh. I, I already asked my question. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I just forgot to lower your hand then. Um, I'll ask um, You've just Karen. muted me, Deborah. Okay. Oops, a daisy. So <laughs> this is an adventure. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to ask um, Kazen, Kazen G, have you asked your question yet? Can you hear us, Kazen? All right. 
No, okay. All right, there's just one more. Suze, I'm gonna try Suze again. Suze, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, technologically unsavvy. Thank you very much for tonight. Um, it's okay. With, right. the with the vaccination of the alpacas, um, yeah. we have sheep as well, and we vaccinate them with six in one. Is there an issue for vaccinating the alpacas with the same six in one, or should it only be five in one? Um, that's a really good question, and I actually don't remember off the top of my head because um, I know that I usually recommend the five in one for alpacas. Um, so can I take that one on notice and get back to you? That'd be lovely. I, Thank you. I can certainly understand wanting to use the same, like the same pack for your sheep yeah. and your alpacas, and especially because I think vaccines, it's really important that you're um, using them up, you know, within date and storing them well, and you don't want vaccine packs kind of hanging around they become less effective so yeah I'll um I'll certainly follow up on that one for you and um, make sure we can get one product for the whole the whole herd sheep and alpacas included oh I think I might have just deleted Sue's <laughs> so if I have I'm gonna have to apologize so we do well, um, have, yeah yeah we we do have um a few hands raised there but what what I'm going to suggest Lou is that um I get them to send me the questions um, and sure. um, then I can probably uh, forward them to you um, and I can I can um, just send out an email to everyone who um, to all the attendees um, so that they can um, catch up on what questions we didn't cover. Is that okay? Yeah, I think that sounds like a good plan. Yeah, okay, okay. All right, so... I'm sorry about that chat function not working. I'm not sure what's what's going on there. So, but I am going to just share my screen now and um, wrap this session up. Was there anything that you wanted to say, Lou, that I that we haven't covered off on? No, I think that was good. And actually, I don't mind that we didn't have the chat box because that was nice to um, hear from the audience out there and, and know who was here um, participating. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks for um, joining us on the on the discovery journey of, um, of uh, Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, so I'm just going to do a little bit of um, wrapping up now, mate. So um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to let people know about the Small Farms Network Capital Region Discussion Group on Facebook. So we do have two pages. Um, one is an information page, but we was all, we've also got this one. Um, that is designed for um, you to join. Um, and so you can jump on there um, and share your stories about what's going on on your farm. Um, and we'd love you to join us there on Facebook if you, if you would like to do that. Uh, just to let you know that I have also loaded um, all of the webinars that we've done previously and some small um, uh, videos that we've shot of different things, including um, poultry and uh, Alan, one of our, our committee members talking about troubles onto our YouTube channel. So you can find us there and catch up on anything that you may have missed. I'd just like to let you know about our upcoming event um, on the 17th of March about Indian minor birds. Um, at this webinar, Bill Hankey from the Canberra Indian Miner Action Group will discuss why Indian miners are a problem and what actions we can take to reduce their impact on native birds and animals. The topics covered in this webinar will include identification of pest bird species, including Indian miners and starlings, methods of control, exclusion from, exclusion from nesting sites and where to get support. So, I'd just like to let you know that once the webinar has finished, um, there will be a survey that props up on, on your Zoom link um, ending of the session. Uh, it would be really great if you could please um, follow that survey and, and uh, sorry, follow that link and take the survey. The other way you can give me some feedback is by sending an email to me at that, at that email address. So 
If you would like to know anything more about the Small Farms Network, whether it be memberships or catching up on an event that you may have missed, um, I do publish um, our webinars and our events um, on our resources page. Um, and you're able to um, go on there. And there's also links to webinars if, if we had have held a webinar for that event. So that's a good place to find out um, about the Small Farms Network uh, and all the programs that we run, that we are running at the moment. So I'm just, we're back, we uh, Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, webinar. I think it was really informative and um, I'm sure that everyone's going to go away with heaps of really uh, great information. So thanks so much. Thanks so much for inviting me. You're welcome. All right, mate. Will you take care? And um, I'm going to end the session for everyone now and uh, I hope to see you all again soon. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.